True Crime Brewery contains disturbing content related to real life crimes. Medical information is opinion based on facts of a crime and should not be interpreted as medical advice or treatment. Listener discretion is advised. Welcome to True Crime Brewery. I'm Jill. And I'm Dick. Back in the spring of 1995, 27-year-old Lynn Turner came into the hospital emergency room in Marietta, Georgia, to have a bump on her head looked at. When her husband Glenn heard where she was going, he came along. Now Glenn had been suffering from stomach pains with vomiting, severe headaches, nosebleeds, and dizziness for days. Lynn didn't seem especially concerned about her husband, who she said had a stomach bug. When Glenn was seen by a doctor, he was diagnosed with dehydration and he was admitted for some IV fluids. He was just 31 years old, so he was expected to perk up quickly. But by the next afternoon, Glenn Turner was dead. The county medical examiner concluded that Glenn had died of a cardiac arrhythmia. Soon after his funeral, his wife Lynn collected about $200,000 in insurance proceeds and death benefits. Then she moved in with her lover, firefighter Randy Thompson. Now fast forward six years and Randy died after suffering from a flu-like illness. His death too was attributed to cardiac disease. Join us at the quiet end for Widowed by Choice. After Randy Thompson's death, family and friends became suspicious and they spoke with police investigators. Lynn's history of deception, infidelity, and greed led to further inquiries into both Glenn and Randy's deaths, finally exposing Lynn Turner as a seductive and cold-blooded killer who put money above the lives of two men who she was supposed to love. And today's beer is uh, from an Atlanta brewery, Sweetwater Brewing Company. It's kind of their flagship beer. It's called 420 Extra Pale Ale. Nice beer. It's a pretty easy one, only 5.4% alcohol by volume. It's a gold color, has a small white head with a bit of lacing. Nice aroma, some sweet malt and citrus, which translates into a taste of biscuit and grapefruit. On the crisp side, pretty nice beer. You know, it really sounds good. I guess the biscuit would be a yeasty taste. Yeah, kind of bready. Yeah. All right, well, let's open it up. Okay. Okay, Dickie, join me down here at the quiet end. This is a case some of our listeners may be familiar with, but I think we've found out some things that are still pretty interesting to hear. Absolutely. So let's start talking about Glenn, Glenn Turner. He was born Maurice Glenn Turner in Atlanta on September 25th, 1963. His parents were Dillard and Catherine Turner. Now he had four siblings and they were spaced out over a decade or so. Tim, Linda, Margie, and James. Glenn was the middle child. And when he was still an infant, the family moved from Atlanta to Smyrna, which was 15 miles northwest of the city, and they bought a house there. Catherine would describe Glenn as a very happy-go-lucky little boy. He was always smiling, and when he wasn't, it was because he had his thumb in his mouth. <laughs> he was a constant thumb sucker, but fortunately for him, he outgrew it just before he started school, so he could avoid a little bit of ridicule. Now, less than two years after the move to Smyrna, the Turner's house was sold, and they lived with Dillard's parents in a nearby small town. Didn't take long for the paternal grandparents to be pretty overwhelmed by the young family living with them. So Dillard and Kathy went looking for a home with enough room for their kids, and they ended up finding what they saw as a perfect place in Alpharetta. So the kids grew up in the small three-bedroom house that was surrounded by acres of woods there. Catherine planted a garden, and they had a creek and a lake out behind some woods. Dillard raised pigs, and he also had hunting dogs. They also had a baby goat that they carried around like a baby. The children had many ways to entertain themselves, and they were good friends as well as siblings. As a stay-at-home mom, Catherine spent time taking the children on long walks in the woods and played educational games with them, so she was very involved, very hands-on. They would often play board games together for hours. 
She would play Monopoly with them to help with counting, and Scrabble to help with spelling and vocabulary. Catherine really devoted herself to raising her children, while Dillard was busy commuting to his job as a rotopress operator in Atlanta. So Glenn was 10 when his youngest brother James was born, and he really wasn't thrilled at first. But eventually he would accept James and adore him, like the rest of the family did. All of the Turner children were in a club called Pathfinders, where they'd ride their bicycles, fly kites, and do other fun activities. Dillard's job, though, kept him up all night, so he slept during the day, and this left Catherine with most of the household and parental responsibilities. But Dillard was a good dad when he was around, it's just that he wasn't there often enough. He was an absent parent most of the time, and Catherine was the one who was the backbone of this family. And although Dillard did earn decent money, stretching his paycheck to support this big family of seven was never easy. So to help with expenses, Catherine started her own cleaning business, and this job allowed her the freedom to make her own hours so she could be home with her kids when she had to be. But still, the pay wasn't great. When James was old enough to go to school, she began working as a school bus driver. So with her husband away most of the time, it really isn't surprising that the marriage began to suffer. And as the marriage fell apart, the four older children began really challenging her. They were always short of money, and Catherine became stressed out most of the time. So it isn't easy having that many kids. It sure isn't. No, especially on a budget. So you got five kids, husband who's rarely home, and you're trying to hold everything together. Yeah, so really a strong woman. Had to be. Had to be. Yep. Now, Catherine had been raised as a Seventh-day Adventist, and she turned to her church for support with her children. And it really helped. She took the children to church, and Dilla joined the church, but rarely attended. Saturday is the holiest day for Seventh-day Adventists. And when Glenn and the older kids rebelled at having to sit in Bible class when their friends were out having fun on Saturdays, it turned out that it would be just Catherine and the baby, James, sitting in the pews for services. Then when he was in the 10th grade, 16-year-old Glenn was sent to boarding school in Gordon County. That's about 75 miles from their home. The Georgia Cumberland Academy was run by the church, and scholarships were given to financially challenged parishioners, like the Turners. So boarding school was the first time Glenn had been away from his family, but he wasn't alone. His big sister Linda was a senior, and she had been at the academy for a year when Glenn joined her. And he also had his good friend Jerry there with him, and the two were inseparable. The students were required to spend part of each day at religion class. For most of the day on Saturday, they were required to attend the chapel on the school grounds. Now, as scholarship students, practically any free time they did have was taken up with chores. So Glenn and Jerry were assigned to build and sell outdoor furniture. It was hard, but Glenn learned a skill, and he actually ended up enjoying the work. Yeah, it actually became a hobby. Now, once he graduated, Glenn tried different jobs in landscaping and construction, building houses and log cabins. He then worked with the United Parcel Service, UPS. Then he and Jerry began working as landscapers at the Smyrna Adventist Hospital. When Jerry left, Glenn stayed on working in security, and he found that this work really suited him. So he considered joining the Marines, but then when he was 21, he told his parents he'd decided that he wanted to be a police officer. In 1984, Glenn was accepted at the North Central Georgia Law Enforcement Academy at Marietta. His sister Linda kindly offered him a place to live with her at the East Lake Apartments while he was in training. So he graduated at the end of 1985 and was assigned to Cobb County's 4th Precinct, and he was really excited. Then after two years working as a patrolman, Glenn was reassigned to the motorcycle unit which he loved. This was really like a dream come true to him. He was partnered up with an officer named David, and the two of them quickly became really good friends. They started working together on the afternoon shift, riding their big Harley Davidson bikes, and they dealt mostly with traffic-related incidents. So this was work that he really enjoyed. In May of 1986, just after he joined the bike unit, Glenn bought a new motorcycle as his personal bike. He called his girlfriend at the time, Stacy to invite her for a ride. Now, her mother wasn't thrilled with this, but she gave in and allowed her to go with Glenn. It was a sunny day, 
and they rode past Kennestone Hospital, stopped at a red light. And there weren't many people on the road that day, and they were the only ones stopped at the light when a blue Ford Escort pulled up beside them in the right lane. Two large men got out of the car. One man was carrying a bat and waving it around and yelling. Len was focused on the man, while Stacy looked behind her and saw a van racing down the street, coming way too fast to be able to stop at the light. So Stacy had her arms wrapped around Glenn's waist and started hitting him and yelling at him to go. But there wasn't any way they could get out of the way in time. So the van slammed into them so hard, Stacy flew off the bike and into the front of the van, which knocked her out. Yeah, so actually, Glenn saved her. He pulled her out so the van didn't run her over. And when she regained consciousness, she could hear Glenn screaming, but she couldn't see him anymore. Now, her helmet had protected her head, but she did have some severe neck pain. She got onto her hands and knees and began crawling down the street, trying to find Glenn following his voice. So Stacy later found out that the van had actually dragged Glenn for several blocks before stopping. The bike had flipped on its side, but Glenn's chest was caught on the rear axle, and his leg got very, very mangled. So when he was taken to the hospital, he was still screaming in pain. His condition did stabilize, but later that night, he became critical. A fat embolism from the break in his leg had traveled to his lungs, so he was in intensive care and not expected to live because that is frequently fatal. It's a very serious condition. Yes. Now, for the next week, Glenn was kept in an induced coma in the ICU. His family stayed at his bedside. They took turns praying for him. Then in the middle of the night, he woke up, and Stacy visited him every day, sometimes sleeping in the ICU waiting room. And Glenn remained in the hospital for 30 days, which was followed by six to eight months of physical therapy, all before he could go back to work. His doctors thought returning to his job as a police officer was unlikely. Stacy did help Catherine take care of Glenn. Once he was back on his feet, he went back to live with his sister and brother-in-law at the East Lake Apartments. Glenn had a pretty positive attitude, and he'd happily spend time with Linda as she shopped and ran errands. As he recovered, Glenn moved into another apartment in the same complex, and despite his life-threatening accident, he couldn't wait to ride his bike again. Yeah, so this recovery was pretty much looked at as a miracle. It sounds like it. Yes, the doctors didn't think he'd even walk again once he was, you know, out of danger of dying from the embolism. Yeah, I mean, anytime you're describing a, a leg as being mangled, yeah, that, that doesn't sound good. No, no, it was very, very serious. But he was brave. He wanted to get right back at it. He really hated being on desk duty. He was patient and just wouldn't give up, and he recovered fully and was accepted for a police motorcycle safety course in 1992. Once he was back on his motorcycle, he was a very happy man. And by then, his relationship with Stacy was kind of falling apart. So that left him available for a woman who desperately wanted to marry a cop, and that would be 22-year-old Lynn Womack. Lynn was born in Marietta in July of 1968. She never really knew her birth parents because they divorced when she was two years old, and when she was five, she was adopted by a woman named Helen Womack, who named her Julia Lynn. So soon, the Julia was dropped, and she was known as Lynn. And then Helen ended up divorcing her husband and got full custody of Lynn. Then, right before Lynn's sixth birthday, Helen got married to a guy named D.L. Gregory. He had a daughter who was 15 years older, and with Gregory, Lynn's family was much more financially comfortable. They lived in a large house with a pool, and they had enough money for Lynn to take horse riding lessons. But, you know, Lynn never really bonded with her new stepfather, and I think she was a bit spoiled by Helen. Yeah, Lynn's mom did indulge her, pretty much giving her anything she wanted, and this would backfire when she hit adolescence. As a teenager, Lynn had a willful streak, and the mother-daughter conflict quickly escalated. There were screaming matches with slammed doors and lots of tears. And after her mother got married, Lynn and Gregory didn't have a good relationship. According to Lynn, Gregory was a grumpy old man. By the time she turned 17, Helen had pretty much lost control of Lynn. She took her to the Charter Peachford Hospital in Atlanta, told the admitting nurse that she suspected Lynn was on drugs. 
She was evaluated, and the doctors released Lynn and told Helen that the girl was not a heavy drug user. She had used marijuana recreationally, but did not have an addiction. Right, so the problem really wasn't drugs. It was more of her personality and her issues. Sounds like. She did appear to outgrow her rebellious stage, and she did graduate from high school in 1986. She enrolled in community college and earned an associate degree. Then she worked as an administrative assistant and then as a secretary in an attorney's office. She seemed to be very interested in law enforcement, and I think a lot of this was because she was romantically drawn to policemen. Now, what I read, and I find it kind of funny, funny weird, is when she was a teenager and a young woman, she would go out and find police cars, you know, that were on patrol or parked on the side of the road and just kind of saunter up there and flirt with the cops. So she really had a thing for them. Now, when their working shifts ended, the officers from the 4th Precinct would often meet at the station and get ready for nights out together. They often got together at someone's apartment before going out to their favorite bars. Glenn and three of his buddies would refer to themselves as the Rat Pep. And in addition to drinking, dancing, and picking up women, one of their favorite things was to organize cookouts. They'd have these cookouts where big groups would go, and mostly officers and their wives, but also some 911 operators and other office workers. So Linda, Glenn's big sister, met Lynn, the woman who would become her sister-in-law, at the barbecue at Glenn's apartment complex. Now, with many cops living rent-free at the complex in exchange for working as security, there were always a lot of young guys ready to party there. Of course, plenty of single women were invited, too. In 1991, Lynn applied for and was hired for training to become a 911 operator with the Cobb County Police Department. She started out working as a report writer, taking complaints about petty crimes from people who called the emergency services complaining about things like stolen lawn furniture or maybe a kid threw a rock at their car. But her ultimate ambition at the time was to become a police officer herself. So she was kind of looking at this as a way to get her foot in the door. So soon after starting her new job, Lynn began hanging out with the police officers after work. To most of the guys in the 4th Precinct, it became clear that Lynn Womack loved a man in uniform. Many of her colleagues believed it was her urge to get close to the police that had motivated her to apply for the dispatcher job, and they would be correct. (laughs) So to many of them, she was just a cop groupie. One of the men who had caught her eye was Paul Rushing who had joined the Cobb County Police Department one year earlier. She met Paul when she was scheduled for some on-the-job instruction. She was a radio operator at the time and was assigned to his shift to ride along with a uniformed officer. And this was done to give everybody a better understanding of what each other's jobs were. She rode in his car for six or seven hours of an eight-hour shift, getting to know Paul as well as his job. So they became close, but Paul was not a potential love interest for Lynn. He had been happily married since 1987, and in 1991, he had just become a new father. So instead of going after Paul, Lynn started dating a cop named Boyd Garrett. So after completing the field training officer program, Paul was on the shift with Glenn Turner, who was now one of the senior officers. Paul wasn't at all surprised when Lynn was attracted to Glenn. Now, Glenn wasn't conventionally handsome, but he was outgoing, a big, strong guy, and just this happy guy that most people really liked. Actually, he'd become known as Buddha by the guys on the job because of his calm demeanor. He was personable, and he was really great with children, too. When the Cobb County Police Department needed someone to make classroom visits and give lectures to the children about things like bike safety or stranger danger, Glenn was usually the go-to guy. Now, from the instant Lynn first saw Glenn, she liked what she saw. He really stood out in the crowd. He was six foot three, so he towered over most of the other men. He was also really easy to be around. Some of Glenn's friends met her at his apartment before going out one night, and she made this really crazy entrance in this form-fitting sleeveless dress with two pistols in her hands, strutting through with the cops, you know, pretending to shoot the pistols in the air. So that was quite a scene, I guess. I bet. Yeah. And then by the end of that night, everyone knew that she was very fond of getting attention. She really seemed happiest when she was dancing and showing off in the middle of a room full of mostly guys. So she was a party girl. Now this was before cell phones, 
so Lynn's pager was buzzing constantly, and after that first night, she was clearly pursuing Glenn, and he was flattered. She began to show up with a group of girlfriends wherever Glenn's rat pack was, and he definitely took notice of her. It was kind of hard to miss her. It sounds like. So it was undeniable that Glenn did have a sexual attraction to Lynn, but it wasn't love at first sight. In fact, the more time Glenn spent with her, the less his buddies liked her. Some of his friends had frequent arguments with Lynn over small things, usually because she liked to be in control of everything. And then there were also many rumors about Lynn being a police groupie who would latch on to any cop who showed her some attention. But once Glenn was officially dating her, they tried to be friends with Lynn. Glenn was sort of gullible and super nice, and Lynn clearly liked that. She knew she could manipulate him. And I think that's the key thing. It seems she, like it. You she know. found somebody she could manage. Right. Well, his friends understood, though, why he would want to be with her. She was full of energy, and she was sexy and, you know, fairly attractive, although I'd say her face leaves a bit to be desired. But what was just as appealing for Glenn was Lynn's interest in many of the things he was interested in, like motorcycles and muscle cars. She could really speak very knowledgeably about his bike, and she was also into stock car racing and NASCAR, spending many weekends at the track and partying late into the night with the mechanics and the fans. She wasn't just hanging out either. She actually knew a lot about cars and engines. She could pop open the hood of a car and diagnose most of the issues herself. So Glenn would brag to friends about her mechanical abilities. She bought herself a motorcycle of her own, too, which really impressed Glenn. And it gave them something in common, something they could do together. So in the early days of their relationship, they'd ride down country roads side by side on their bikes. So, just looking at that part of their relationship to Glenn, she seemed like the perfect girlfriend for him. Yeah, no kidding. But, She's... you know, she was not without red flags. True. So, his friends and family did agree that Glenn was like putty in Lynn's hands. He had told his friends that he had no intention of getting married anytime soon, but that seemed to be a challenge that Lynn just couldn't resist. Once she made up her mind, she seduced him with sex and gifts. She spent a lot of money winning him over. For example, she'd show up at his place with expensive gifts, like a camera or high-priced accessories for his car or designer clothing. She bought tickets to Atlanta Braves games. Lynn's policeman's salary couldn't afford these luxuries, but Lynn's salary as a 911 operator was not enough either. So it's anyone's guess how she afforded all of this. She also worked for an attorney part-time, and when the practice threw a party, she would steal 20 to 30 bottles of expensive liquor to impress Glenn and his buddies because they would have no idea it was stolen goods. Well, that had to be quite a practice if she could steal that many bottles without and, them noticing. And not getting caught. Right. That's I'm a thinking, lot of liquor. These lawyers drink like fish. Holy cow. Yeah, it must have been a big group, I guess. <laughs> it must have been. <laughs> but in the beginning, Glenn's sister Linda kind of liked Lynn. She knew that Lynn did data entry work part-time, and she seemed like a really hard worker to her. But for Linda, Glenn's sexy new girlfriend seemed to kind of come out of nowhere, because nobody knew much about her, about her past. She was very secretive. Now, if they were going out somewhere and Lynn found out that she wasn't going to be the center of attention, she'd usually bail out, because that was just no fun to her. It really seemed that she had to be in the middle of everything, or she'd leave. She'd enter a bar, and she always had something to do to get everyone looking at her. But Glenn was obviously falling in love with her, so his family and friends had to accept her for his sake. And they tried to. That they did. And once the romance became really serious, Glenn took Lynn home to meet his mom. And Catherine liked her at first, but Lynn wasn't super friendly with her. She saw her at Linda's birthday party and then at Glenn's apartment a few times. And once they did go shopping together. And Lynn always talked about Glenn. Seemed like she cared about him, but she also seemed jealous and controlling. She was constantly checking his cell phone to see who he was talking to. So in 1993, Glenn moved in with Lynn at her house. And when he moved in, he saw that she had no furniture except for a waterbed, one chair, and a little table. Now, there was no doubt that Lynn was in charge, 
and instead of arguing with her, Glenn usually just let her have her way. Because Lynn also had a temper. She'd easily fly off the handle and throw things and walk out of the house. Now at first, Glenn would go running after her and try and get her to come back, but then he kind of gave up and began ignoring it because he knew she'd eventually return. Well, yeah, it was most likely an attention-getting device. But all through this time, financially, it seems like Lynn was overextended. Seems like she was house poor. She had a lot of credit card bills. She did have a nice house, but she couldn't afford to furnish it. So, of course, getting Glenn to move in helped her out financially, too. Yeah, but Glenn's sister was uncomfortable, even after they did start living together, because Lynn was a shameless flirt. So whenever they went out, she's hitting on other guys. She liked to show off her body. She liked to sit on men's laps. She liked to give them neck massages. And these are guys other than her boyfriend. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly disrespectful to Glenn and their relationship. Now, Glenn's friends suspected that he was in a monogamous relationship, but Lynn wasn't. That's According, a good way to put it. Yeah, right? Yeah. According to one friend of Glenn's, Lynn was seeing five or six other police officers behind Glenn's back. Wow, now how'd she get away with that? Yeah, that's a tough one to do. She must have had a lot of energy. Eventually, Glenn decided that there was only one way to make Lynn all his, and that's to marry her. Oh, big mistake. Well, it wasn't met with much favor. When he, he shared this theory with his friends, uh -huh. they disapproved. Now, he confided to them that he was going to propose to her. If they didn't see her as wife material, and they predicted trouble. Well, yeah, if someone's cheating on you, <laughs> to think that marrying them would, you know, fix it is kind of crazy. Well, of course. Yeah, though I don't know why he thought that. Maybe she led him to believe that. Maybe she said, well, you won't marry me, so could have been something like that going on. But, of course, we'll never know. No, we won't. But, like you said, the friends were predicting that this would be a problem. Yeah, but nevertheless, Glenn proposed and Lynn accepted. And they, and they set a wedding date for the following August. So over the months they were engaged, nothing Lynn said or did endeared her any more to his friends and family. They continued to warn him and plead with him to reconsider his decision. But Glenn had made up his mind. Catherine tried to be happy for her son. But Linda was so upset at the idea of Lynn becoming her sister-in-law, she didn't even want to attend the wedding. But Lynn was much better at winning over the men in Glenn's family. Well, for a while. But at the beginning, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The few times when he met Lynn, Glenn's father got along well with her. So the family resolved they were going to set aside their doubts and be at Glenn's side on what was meant to be the happiest day of his life. Sure. <laughs> but they really weren't thrilled at the wedding, were they? No. And she did make a very pretty bride. She had this white satin and lace gown with a long train and puffy sleeves, you know, which was the style at the time. After the couple exchanged vows, they each took a taper to light the unity candle, but it went out. Then they lit two more candles and those went out. So after repeated tries, they gave up. And this was kind of a big deal to Glenn's family. According to Glenn's mother, it sent a chill through her because she was superstitious and the candles were not lighting. So there had to be some kind of a reason for that. She hmm. saw it as an omen about the marriage. Well, if you tell this in hindsight, it's true. Well, yeah, I don't know if the candle really has anything to do with it, though. I'm sure it doesn't. No, but they thought so. They had a bad feeling and they were already predisposed to feeling that way, right? Exactly. So James, the little brother, was pushed as the best man to make a speech at the reception. And when he stood up in front of the guests, he said something like, I feel more like I'm at a funeral than a wedding. <laughs> so I don't know if he'd had a few or why he said that. It seems pretty outrageous, but a, a lot of people laughed because I guess that was just the overall consensus that the marriage was a big mistake. So, of course, Lynn wasn't amused by that comment. But it didn't seem to matter to Glenn. He just seemed like a really happy guy, had this big smile from ear to ear all of the day. You know, and his family couldn't help but try and be happy for him because he was happy, even though they saw trouble in the future. So they went on their honeymoon, which was a cruise, but Lynn hated it. Well, Glenn's the one that set it up, and I think he made an error. So this was one of those Disney cruises that was filled with kids and families. Yeah, the big red boat cruises? Yeah, so... 
Her complaints probably did have some validity because it wasn't a romantic cruise, was it? No, kids everywhere and they'd have chicken fingers and tater tots and Mickey Mouse. Yeah, and according to Glenn, <laughs> Lynn was a nightmare the entire time, making scenes and just drinking so much every day. Yeah, so you'd think you could realize, well, you know, he did this and he meant well and you'd make the most of it, but not Lynn. She didn't try and make the most of it. She was actually quite angry. She was trying to make the least of it. Yes. So after they were back home and in their day-to-day -day lives, Glenn tried to make Lynn happy by taking care of her financial demands because she did have them. The Monday after their return, Lynn had Glenn take her to get a life insurance policy. Now Lynn had already gotten a policy, but they were supposed to go and get another one. Lynn said it had to be done that same day. Later on, when Glenn called his mother to tell her that she was no longer his beneficiary on a policy that he'd taken out years before, it sounded to Catherine like Lynn was standing over his shoulder telling him what to say. So there's nothing wrong with him changing his life insurance from his mother to his wife once he's married. But it just seemed odd to have so much concern about life insurance. So Catherine decided that Lynn was just worried about her new husband getting killed in the line of duty. Well, that's, trying to give her the benefit of the doubt. That's a charitable thing there. Well, I mean, in normal life, that's what you'd think. Why would you think anything different? She just married him. Yeah, although it seems like she was universally disliked by friends and relatives. True. So they'd think the worst. Yeah, you're right. That's true. So, and Lynn was in charge of the couple's finances from the very beginning. Since Glenn had some debts of his own before they were married, he didn't feel that he could object because Lynn seemed to know what she was doing. She told him she was planning for their future. They would start by paying off his outstanding bills, and she put him on a budget of $20 a week spending money. <laughs> <laughs> Guess he's not going to be hanging out with the boys after work not that much. Not a lot, no. Then a month after the wedding, she convinced Glenn to buy another life insurance policy for $100,000 and name her as the sole beneficiary. Well, Glenn and Lynn's honeymoon had been disappointing, but the marriage really didn't fare much better. According to Glenn's friends, the relationship really deteriorated into a one-sided relationship within a week or two of getting married, so that's fast. <laughs> it sure is. Then within a few weeks of the wedding, Glenn confided to a friend that they were no longer having sex. So Lynn was claiming to have some female problem, and she was using that to avoid marital relations, which just didn't seem to make sense. And it wasn't just that, they were sleeping in separate beds. So Glenn's family went to see their wedding pictures, but Lynn didn't make them very welcome. She wouldn't let them talk to Glenn when they called the house either. Glenn's brother James heard background noises every time he called his brother, and he'd ask Glenn, what's that? And Glenn would say something like, it's Lynn, she wants me to get off the phone. So super bossy and controlling, if nothing else. I guess, huh? Yes. Despite his unhappiness in the marriage, Glenn was loyal to Lynn. When they got married, he was committed to her, and he was more committed to the relationship than she was, and it was heartbreaking for those who loved him to see that he wasn't getting anything emotionally or financially from his wife. Well, yeah, Lynn had gotten Glenn to marry her, but what she didn't know at the time was that Glenn was keeping in touch with that former girlfriend that he was in the motorcycle accident with, Stacy. Now, according to Stacy, this was all innocent communication, but she said they did still have feelings for each other. They would visit at her parents' house when she came back to Georgia to see her family. But Stacy could see that Glenn's marriage was not a happy one. Their first Christmas together, Glenn and Lynn spent the day at his sister Linda's house. And this gave the family some hope that maybe things would work out for Lynn and Glenn. But no, things did continue to deteriorate in the relationship. And now a word from True Crime Brewery, After Dark. It was just an ordinary night at home. I took the dogs out, I brushed my teeth, and I put on my coziest PJs. But then I couldn't find my husband. Still, I kept cool. I didn't go looking for him at the local breweries or call the police to report him missing. And he was soon found alive and well in his little man cave, getting some quality time with best fiends. Now he'd done this before, and as his wife and life partner, I accept that he'll do it again in the future. 
Yes, others may have been surprised by my impromptu disappearing act, but we've been married for a long time, and Jill knows me quite well. She's having just as much fun with Best Fiends as I do, so she understands. Best Fiends is a mobile puzzle game that anyone can download and play. Whether you have minutes or hours, it's always right there for you on your phone or tablet. And the more you play, the more challenges you face. New characters and puzzles are added all of the time. And there are also fun events where you get to compete for in-game rewards. Yeah, we both lose track of time when we enter the Best Fiends playing zone. Best Fiends has new content and characters added constantly. So we never get bored. You just can't. I've reached level 931. And with literally thousands of levels, I don't worry about running out of gameplay at all. Because the more you win, the more challenges you face. It's really fun to strategize and figure out which matches to make to cause little explosions that take down those evil slugs. And with offline play, you can have fun even if you lose your Wi-Fi connection. So download your new favorite getaway, Best Fiends, for free today on the App Store or Google Play. You'll even get $5 worth of in-game rewards when you reach level 5. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. And I'd like to take just a moment here to tell our listeners about True Crime Brewery Premium. If you'd like to support our show and get ad-free episodes, subscribing to TCB for ad-free and premium episodes might be just the thing for you. Once you subscribe, you get our regular episodes ad-free, plus you get a special members-only episode each month and a gift. For the gift, you get to pick a set of coasters, a bottle opener, or our classic TCB snifter. So just go to tiegrabber.com and you can look at our subscribing options. There are over 150 shows in this members only TCB premium show that you can listen to and binge. You also have the option of subscribing through Patreon and you can do that by going to patreon.com forward slash tiegrabber. Either way, you'll get your own personal subscription link that you can paste into your podcast app so you can listen there as well as on our website without commercials or promos like this one. And one more thing, if you have comments, a case suggestion, or a beer recommendation to share with us, please send us an email to truecrimebrewery at tiegrabber.com or leave us a voicemail. I'll put a direct link in our show notes for you to click on and you can record your voicemail for a future show right on your device. And for the rest of the month of June, anyone who gets their voicemail played on the show is going to get a free TCB wallet-sized bottle opener. Not surprisingly, Lynn began cheating on Glenn. Some of his police friends heard that Lynn was having an affair with a 25-year-old man who lived two counties over, and her lover was one of their own, a Forsyth County Sheriff's deputy working on traffic control. The resemblance between her lover, Randy, and Glenn was stunning. Both were big, muscular, physically fit men, and although both worked in law enforcement, they'd never met. Randy had no idea that his girlfriend had a husband. She told him that she had been married once, but it hadn't worked out, and now she was a divorcee, ready for a new relationship. Like Lynn, Randy was into cars and NASCAR, and this became a perfect excuse for her to slip away for weekends with him. She'd tell Glenn she's going to a race, and he said, yeah, okay, because he's just too tired, too busy with work to complain about things. So he probably looked at it as a time when he had some relaxation because she wasn't around berating him for something. I suppose, but don't you think he was suspicious that she was seeing someone else then? You'd have to be. Yeah, because it would often be close to midnight before he finished his eight-hour shift, and when he got home at night, he'd just fall into bed and pass out exhausted. And since they slept in separate bedrooms, he wouldn't even know when she came home. He wouldn't. So Randy Thompson, the lover, he was born in Warner Robins, Georgia in 1968. By the time he was two, his parents had divorced. And a year later, his mom, Nita, married Perry Thompson. Now Perry later joined the Gwinnett County Police Department. Randy's sister, Kimberly, was born when he was four. And three years later, his sister, Brandy, was born. Like Glenn, Randy had grown up in the country, and with her husband away on long-distance trips for much of the time, Nita did most of the child care, staying at home until the youngest had started school. Then she worked at a bank. Now the family had 250 acres of land, 
and lived in a big house that they rented from the farmer slash owner. Yeah, so they had access to the land, but they didn't own it. They really didn't have much money. But they okay. got to enjoy the land and the animals. Yeah, it's just that they had no financial stake in it. Yeah, they were kind of like, what do you call it? Sharecroppers. Yeah. Yeah. And they had livestock and they had pets. Randy particularly loved working with the animals. He would get up every morning at 5 o'clock to care for his calves. Randy was a real character, according to his mother. He loved life, he loved the outdoors, and he loved sports. When he was growing up, he was deeply protective of his two little sisters, especially Kimberly, who had epilepsy. And despite frequent arguments between his mother and his stepfather, as soon as he turned 18, Randy legally changed his name to his stepfather's. And after high school, Randy went to work for the sheriff's department, starting as a dispatcher before becoming a deputy. But his real goal in life was to be a firefighter. And as soon as he was old enough, he became a volunteer fireman. Yeah, and by the time he was 22, Randy was in love. Then his 19-year-old girlfriend, Dara, became pregnant. A wedding was arranged by her parents, and the couple lived with his parents. But the marriage was on shaky ground right from the beginning. After just one year, they separated, but Randy did manage to stay very close to his son, Nicholas, who was born in 1991. Randy's mom believed that, despite the failure of their marriage, Randy always loved Dara, and when he died, he still loved her. He had dated a few girls, but there was never really anyone serious until Lynn Turner entered his life. Now, as she had when she set her sights on Glenn, Lynn went all out to win over Randy. She actually gave him all sorts of expensive gifts, including a leather coat and leather pants. When he would protest that she was spending too much money on him, she'd just smile and tell him he was worth it. She chased him once she had her sights set on Randy, and she just didn't give up. Randy tried to break things off once, but Lynn kept bothering him. Now, of course, his parents thought Lynn was divorced, but she seemed incapable of sticking with the lies that she told. Although she led Randy and his parents to believe she was divorced, she did tell some of his friends that she was a widow. She actually described herself to Randy's sister, Angie, as a police widow whose husband had been killed in the line of duty. And I almost think that's what she was hoping for. Yes. Is that too much to say? I don't think so. I don't think so, in hindsight at least. So Lynn told Randy's parents that she was working at the Cobb County Police Department and she gave them no reason at all to suspect that she was leading a double life. Because remember, there's still another husband out there, right? Well, yes, she has a husband. Yeah. If they thought it was odd that Randy had never been to her place, they never said anything about that. It never occurred to them that Lynn was married to someone else. They knew her job didn't pay enough to live the lifestyle she was living, so they did want to know where she had gotten her money. And she told them that her grandmother had died and she'd gotten a large inheritance. Well, I guess it's true that she did get some inheritance, but not a large one and not enough to afford so much. Now, meanwhile, Glenn's friends on the force were becoming increasingly disgusted by the way she was humiliating and mistreating him. They saw the way she treated him, which was just really bad. Glenn would go to the dispatch center where Lynn worked and everyone was happy when he turned up with donuts for them except for Lynn, who was dismissive and rude. And that happened every time he took food to her. Cynthia Mull, who worked with Lynn at the 911 switchboard, later testified that she thought Lynn's attitude towards her husband was hostile when he showed up with dinner or treats for her and the other dispatchers. She was very cold to him. Now, sometimes she'd go on these last minute trips, usually to watch car racing, and she'd tell him she didn't want him to go with her. But he used to say, the only way this relationship will come to an end is when I've done everything I can to make it work. So he was pretty devoted to the marriage, apparently. Yeah, I just wonder, you know, he's obviously not happy. And she's not behaving well towards him. And he sticks it out. And I'm just wondering why. They don't have kids. Well, he did... You know, maybe he took his vows very seriously. He must have. Yeah. And maybe he really cared about her, even though she was horrible to him. Yeah, his friends were disturbed when they saw how miserable Glenn was in his marriage. Well, yeah, because he just seemed like such a nice guy. Yeah. And he was eating dinner at Chili's with a friend one night when he suddenly started sobbing. 
Glenn told his friends that they had argued, and Lynn had told him she didn't love him and never had. Oh, that's so shitty. That's just not something to say. That's awful. Kind of a deal breaker. You would think. Glenn didn't trust her anymore. In February, Glenn turned up at his sister Linda's house, and while they were talking that day, he told her that Lynn was looking at a house to buy and coming. He said that he wouldn't be moving, and the marriage was over. Now, his brother-in-law tried to convince him to work on the marriage, but Glenn said it was impossible. Sure. Well, by the end of that month, Glenn had more than his marriage making him miserable. Normally a strong, healthy guy, he'd been feeling really sick for days. So on the morning of Tuesday, February 28th, he called his friend, Mike Archer. He was shivering with chills and his voice was really weak and shaky. I'm not going to make it in today, he said. I'm so sick, I think I'm going to die. The next day he called in sick again. Just the fact that he wasn't coming into work had the whole police force talking because no one could remember Glenn being out of work for three days in a row ever before. So he had to be really sick. When Glenn spoke to Mike again the next morning, he said he was still too sick to come in and that he felt like he was dying. Glenn said he felt like he had a really bad stomach flu for a week or more. He had cramps, vomiting, chills, and even a fever. Then Glenn said he was having nosebleeds, so that really set off some alarms. He said he couldn't stop the nosebleeds, and that's what he was really worried about, because that's concerning. So, of course, his co-workers all urged him to go to the hospital. Then on March 2nd, Lynn called her mother because she'd been putting a fan in her attic and she'd bumped her head. Her mother rushed right over and saw Lynn dabbing at an egg-sized bump on the top of her head. No cut, no bleeding, just a little goose egg. And as she was showing her mother the spot, Glenn came out of his bedroom. And he looked a lot worse. He was very pale, his eyes were kind of blank, and he was in a lot of pain. He told Lynn's mom that he'd had the flu for over a week, he wasn't feeling well, and he'd like to go with them to the hospital, since Lynn was already going to have her head looked at. So with Lynn touching the bump on her head, and Glenn clutching his stomach and moaning in pain, Lynn's mother drove them both to the Kennestone Hospital. So they arrived at the ER before two in the afternoon, and at the door, Lynn said, I've had an accident and hurt my head, and my husband is sick with the flu. I don't think he can walk in by himself. So Glenn was wheeled into triage while Lynn was taken to another part of the ER, and she was seen by a Dr. Alan Maloon. As he checked out the bump, she told him she'd fallen and hit her head on a two-by-four plank of wood. So she'd already changed that story from what she told her mother. She said her vision was blurred and that she had a really bad headache, too. Although she had no lacerations and the wound appeared very minor, the doctor ordered a CAT scan of her head and it showed no injury. Dr. Donald Freeman examined Glenn. Glenn told him he felt lightheaded, especially when he stood up. He'd been aching all over, had blinding headaches, diarrhea, and vomiting for several days. So the exam showed that Glenn was severely dehydrated, probably due to all the vomiting and he had the symptoms of a stomach bug. Pulse and blood pressure were abnormally high as a result. So they started an IV and he's given fluids to rehydrate him. Usually after a liter or two of fluids, you're gonna feel a little better. Not with Glenn, he felt just as bad. After four hours of monitoring, nothing more than a virus was diagnosed. Even though he was very ill, Glenn didn't complain. He was given medicine for his nausea and vomiting. Unfortunately, no blood tests were done. I don't know how you get away without doing blood tests. Well, yeah, you'd think if they're starting an IV, they'd draw some blood first. Right? I mean, you, you do some blood work to see if you could be suffering from a bacterial infection or, you know, besides stomach flu. Sure. Uh, you do some blood tests to assess hydration. A good thing. You, you get valuable information. Yeah, so I do think that the ER was negligent that night. But it struck the nurse that was taking care of Glenn of very odd that Lynn didn't seem to care. She wasn't asking for more tests or showing a lot of concern. She just didn't seem very anxious. Around 6 p.m. she was told she could take him home and the doctor said that the IV fluids had helped and the medication he was going to prescribe would take care of the sickness and pain over the next couple days. Now Lynn didn't ask any questions. She picked up his belongings without even talking to him. 
When he was released at 20 after 6 that evening, though, he really wasn't feeling much better. But he was the kind of guy to just go along. And his wife didn't seem concerned, so they both went home. That night, Glenn must have felt a little better. He called his sister Linda, and he told her that he'd been to the ER and that he was going to be fine. Knowing that she was about to leave for a drive south with her brother to Jacksonville, Florida, for a family reunion, Glenn called his mom and told her he was feeling better and would probably be back to work the next day. But this was the last time his mother heard his voice ever. Before she left the next morning, she called to check on Glenn again, but no one answered. So she figured if there was nobody answering the phone, he must have gone back to work and everything was okay. Fair enough. Right, you would think. Yeah. But by the afternoon of the next day, which was Friday, March 3rd, Glenn was dead. When the EMTs got to his house, they found him in the front bedroom, on his left side, on the bed. And there's nothing they could do for him. He was dressed in his boxer shorts and wrapped up in blankets. His pants were crumpled up on the floor. And beside him on the nightstand were four plastic containers of drugs and a picture of his mother. His friend and co-worker, Mike Archer, was at his apartment when his pager went off around one on the afternoon. He called the precinct and spoke with the other sergeant on his shift. Her voice was sad, and she told Mike that Glenn Turner had been found dead in his bed. Now, Mike was incredulous, and then his first thought was, Lynn killed him. That's remarkable, but actually, many people in Glenn's life, that was their first thought. That she, amazes me. She must have me. been some doozy. You'd have to be for people to just want to assume you killed him. There must have been a lot of red flags flapping in the air. She was universally disliked. Yes. So as the news spread to Glenn's friends on the force, emergency vehicles lined up in the street in front of his house. Once the police arrived, Lynn told them that Glenn had been sick and that she'd taken him to the emergency room the day before. She said he'd felt better after being treated and they'd driven home. But during the night, she said he'd been restless. She'd woken up, checked the room where he'd been sleeping, and found the bed empty. Then when she looked at the clock, she saw it was 3 a.m. She went downstairs but couldn't find him. Then she heard some noises coming from the basement. So she walked down to find him, ranting and raving like a madman down there. She said he was hallucinating and he had lifted a plastic container of gasoline and nearly had the top off to drink it before she grabbed it away from him. Then when they were back upstairs, he told her he could fly. He went out on the second floor deck and nearly succeeded in jumping off, she said. But she was able to get him down. She talked him into going back to bed and she said he seemed better that morning. She told him she had to go out to the store and she gave him some green jello. When she got back home around two in the afternoon, she went into his bedroom and saw him lying motionless under the covers. She walked to the bed, lifted the covers, and could see that his skin was all purplish and mottled. So she knew he was dead. Now, why you would leave him alone, I don't know. For a while, too. I mean, yeah, like four hours? Yeah. Yeah, so, I'd want to know more about where she went during that time. It seems weird. Now, many of the people who knew Glenn and Lynn believe that Lynn was somehow responsible for his death. Absolutely. His body was taken to the office of the Cobb County Medical Examiner for an autopsy, and that was done the next day. Glenn's mom, Catherine, returned from Florida on Saturday after learning that her son had died. She and several other family members went to the house to see Lynn, and when Lynn answered the door, she cheerfully said, hey, the whole clan's here. Well, Catherine reached out to hug Lynn, but Lynn wasn't having any of that. She just turned and let everyone into the house. And when they were in there, Lynn repeated that she had found the delirious Glenn on Thursday night, stumbling around in the basement trying to drink gasoline. Then she complained that she was pissed off because the police had rummaged through the nightstand in the bedroom where Glenn had died and taken away pills that had been prescribed for her. Now, who would really care about that if they just lost their husband? Come on. Just Lynn. Maybe more. Well, family members described Lynn is not crying and not upset that day. When they visited the funeral home the next day to make plans, they found Lynn to be very controlling about how the funeral would go, especially about the obituary, which was really weird. She insisted she did not want to be named as Glenn's wife or widow in his obituary. She explained she didn't want the media getting a hold of her name and address, 
so she only wanted to be identified as Julia. Now, this was pretty shocking to her family, but if you think about, she's already been having a relationship with this Randy now for years. So maybe she wouldn't want him or his family to see that she was a recent widow. Right. Because her whole story has been divorced, she's single. Yes. Yeah. Now we know that people do grieve differently, but there's really something about Lynn's attitude that was just disturbing. She was hostile and demanding, insisting that things be handled the way she wanted. The Cobb County Police Department was this really tightly knit group, and they were determined they were going to give him a proper police officer's service. Lynn wanted to keep things quieter, but they persuaded her that Glenn would have wanted a hero's funeral, and they were determined to give him one. So that's one thing they did not back off on. Glenn's grieving family was disturbed by Lynn's apparent lack of grief or respect for her husband. And when people offered their condolences, she seemed just to be fed up with the whole thing. It's kind of like she wanted to just put it behind her and be done with yeah, it. Yeah, let's get this over with. Yes. At her side throughout the funeral was Paul Rushing, Glenn's one-time friend in the Cobb County Motorcycle Unit. Yeah, so apparently this trial was on Court TV back in the day when it happened. And Court TV used to play the live trials quite a bit. And there were many witnesses that were at that funeral that were unhappy with her behavior. And also she wore a pink jumpsuit, one of them said. So that doesn't seem appropriate for the widow either. No, it doesn't. And during the hours her husband's body was at the funeral home, no one saw her go anywhere near the casket. There were two viewing times scheduled, but Lynn kept her distance from Glenn's family the whole time. At the evening session, Lynn was infuriated by her sister-in-law's impatience and disrespect. The viewing wasn't even over when she went up to Linda and said, I gotta get the hell out of here, and left. <laughs> now Lynn was overheard making comments at the wake about how she had to get out, and she'd been there long enough. She was done with it. At 11 a.m. on Monday, March 6th, Glenn's funeral was held at the Marietta Seventh-day Adventist Church. Lynn sat in the front row with Paul Rushing, and that alone seemed inappropriate because she was so flirty with that guy. Glenn's brother sat behind them at the service and in the church and heard the two laughing. Many people noticed her flirting with police officers and giggling throughout the whole service. And once it was over, Cobb County Harley-Davidson Bikes led Glenn to his final resting place at Cheatham Hill Memorial Park. But Lynn was just standoffish. If you didn't know, you would have thought that she never knew Glenn, that she was just some periphery person. Yeah, right. Yeah, and very inappropriate behavior for anyone's funeral. Now, in the weeks after Glenn's death, Glenn's mother tried to reach out to Lynn, offering to be with her as she sorted through his personal things. But Lynn made it pretty obvious that she wanted nothing at all to do with any of her in-laws. She did allow Catherine to come to the house for a couple of weeks after he died to pick up some things but she wouldn't let her go upstairs. Lynn and Glenn had been deeply in debt at the time of his death, but after his death, she was certainly more financially comfortable. But Lynn didn't know how to save or budget, so this money went flying out of her hands. It really did. So although Glenn's family and friends believed that Lynn must have had something to do with his death, there was really nothing they could do. When they received the medical examiner's autopsy report, it listed his cause of death was cardiac dysrhythmia due to cardiomegaly, which means an enlarged heart. Glenn had died of natural causes due to this enlarged heart. The report noted that Glenn had been ill for four to five days before his death, and it was noted that during the last night of his life, Glenn had reportedly been disoriented. There were no bruises or marks on his body that would suggest any foul play to the medical examiner. Now the family asked for a copy of this report. After reading it over, Glenn's mom, Catherine, called the medical examiner's office and she made an appointment. She wanted to meet and speak with him, which sounds fair to me, because there had been a notation of a green substance in his stomach and she had more questions about that. But she really felt she was dismissed when she got there. There was just an underling working there who spoke with her and really didn't give her any answers. So while this family's trying to deal with their pain, Lynn has really just moved on with her life at lightning speed, just seemingly unbothered by her husband's death. Now, even if the marriage isn't great, this seems so inappropriate. Yes, it does. 
And to the Turners, it almost seemed as if she got a kick out of making them even more miserable than they already were. Like she was just a mean person. Lynn never returned to her job as a 911 dispatcher. She didn't answer the calls from work, and she dropped off her uniform without speaking to anyone. Four days after Glenn's funeral, Lynn signed a lease on an apartment with Randy Thompson listed as an occupant. Okay, hold the phone. Time out. I just want to make sure we all realize that you said four days. I did. Four I days. said four days. She's getting an apartment with her lover four days after her husband died. Now, the Turner family didn't know about this ongoing relationship with Randy, of course. And when she moved in with him, she didn't even tell her own mother about it. But she cut off all ties with Glenn's family and friends right then. Then she took another job in a 911 center, this time at the Forsyth County Sheriff's Office. She had applied to be a police officer, and she had passed the physical test, but she'd failed the psychological test. And I would love to see that, but it's not available. She moved from Marietta to Cumming, Georgia, where she lived with Randy. In June, she surprised Randy and a couple that they had befriended with this all-expenses-paid cruise to the Bahamas, St. Thomas, and Puerto Rico. So it's one thing to take your boyfriend, but to take your boyfriend and another couple? Crazy. She's not a wealthy person. Seems like she just wanted to impress them. But the two couples spent their days relaxing in the sun, sightseeing, and sipping on tropical drinks. And at night, she and Randy would sleep in their upper-class cabin, where they had two rooms and a balcony. So it really seemed that no expense had been spared by Lynn. Yeah, she went all in, didn't she? Absolutely. Six months after they moved into the apartment together, Lynn purchased a house for her and Randy. And this is certainly more expensive and spacious than the home she had shared with Glenn, and she decorated this new home lavishly. Yeah, leather furniture, all kinds of, you know, decor. But she's basically moved in with this guy in less than a week after her husband died. So yes. that's remarkable. Well, they knew it was right. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It just, it just True love. It just felt like the thing to do. Yeah. Well, by April of 1996, Lynn was pregnant with Randy's baby. She gave birth the following January to a daughter, just 10 months after Glenn's death. Now, by then, Lynn and Randy were arguing quite a bit. At first, it was she who wanted to get married. Then he proposed and she refused. Now, if Lynn did remarry, she'd no longer collect the $700 a month on Glenn's pension as his surviving spouse, so that may have been an, a reason for that. About one month before their daughter was born, Randy inquired about having his fiance named as the beneficiary on a State Farm insurance policy he had. Yeah, and then although the hostility between the two of them eased up a little over Christmas and New Year's, by early 1997, Randy's relationship with Lynn was making him unhappy. He had succeeded in getting Lynn on a state farm policy. Now, Lynn called the sheriff's office. Again, this is early 1997. And she said that her boyfriend had swallowed a bunch of sleeping pills. She said to the sheriff's office she was afraid he was suicidal and asked them to send an ambulance. So responding officers and paramedics answered the call. A doctor arrived and examined Randy and decided that he actually had not overdosed. So the doctor and the EMTs after going over things with him, left him there at home to sleep off what he had taken. So that doesn't seem right. And the only thing I can think is they didn't want him to get in trouble and lose his job as a fireman. So they were kind of covering for him. Yeah, because it certainly sounds like he ought to be or oh, absolutely. admitted and evaluated. I mean, even if what he took was not fatal, he probably didn't know that and it could have been an attempt. So things were getting so bad in the relationship with Lynn that many people really weren't surprised by Randy's increased drinking and then his use of opiates. Despite this, Lynn became pregnant with their second child. Policewoman J.M., who'd been sent to Lynn's house to break up a fight that had ended with Randy being arrested, soon became Lynn's new best friend. These two women went on shopping sprees together, or they'd just hang out at Lynn's house. And while there, J.M. witnessed the couple's squabbles. 
and she described them as having a love-hate relationship. Lynn then developed postpartum gynecological problems after giving birth to a son, and she had a hysterectomy. Then after their son was born, Lynn insisted on additional life insurance. So Randy doubled his coverage to $200,000. Later that year, he bought another policy for $36,000. Lynn, of course, was the beneficiary. So there were nights when he slept on friends' couches just to avoid confrontations with Lynn. But when he wanted to see his kids, he had to go home. But then once he was back, the fights would happen again and he'd leave again. So it was just a bad situation. Just a vicious cycle. Yeah. So for the next couple of years, Randy tried to make the best of things. Periodically, he'd move out, but then the separation from his children would become unbearable and he would go back. His family didn't realize how difficult the situation at home had become until January 1999. That evening, Randy called his parents and told them that he had taken some pills. His speech was slurred and he was crying. He was taken to the ER. His stomach was pumped. He was talked to by the doctors. They concluded that he was no longer a danger to himself, and they released him into the custody of his parents. A doctor told his parents that he hadn't taken anything that would have killed him. Well, still, yeah. it's a cry for help. It's concerning. Again, maybe an admission would be in order. I think so. Yeah, this off-and-on relationship with Lynn was clearly taking a toll on him. And even though he wanted to be with his children who lived with Lynn, he decided maybe the best thing for him was to just try and move on. Everyone was telling him to make a clean break from Lynn, so he needed to find a home of his own and start over. Until he found a place, he stayed with a firefighter friend, Glenn Everett. On April 1st, 1999, Randy moved into the Overlook Club apartment complex, but he still continued to maintain the lawn and do the chores around Lynn's house as well as spend a considerable amount of time with his kids. Now, Lynn told her girlfriend, J.M., that since the separation, she and Randy were getting along a lot better. So sometimes people can't live together and they can be friends. But that's not how it went. Now, Lynn used the children so that she could lure Randy back into her life. If he wouldn't come home, she told him, then he could only see the kids at the fire station. And she would not let them stay overnight at his apartment under any circumstances. Now, Randy knew he was being manipulated, but he really didn't know how to deal with it. And his parents also saw a lot less of their grandkids. A constant issue between Lynn and Randy was Randy's refusal to pay his child support payments. Actually, he wasn't refusing. He just said he wouldn't let Lynn take the money. He would let the court take the money and dole it out to Lynn, but he wasn't paying any money directly to Lynn. And that's because he didn't trust her, and he wasn't even sure if he'd get credit for it. She was very sneaky, let's be honest. Finally, in 2000, Randy decided he had moved out for good. He no longer had any trust in Lynn. Also, by now, he knew that she had cheated on Glenn Turner with him. So he began to have doubts that his son was even his biological child. He actually told a friend that he was going to demand a paternity test to find out if he really was the father. Randy confided these suspicions about his son to his former wife, Dara, and Lynn was trying to pressure him to give her money for the children. But then when he told Lynn that he was going to ask the court to order a paternity test, she backed off and dropped the subject. He also complained about Lynn, who had showered their children with love and toys, had now started being verbally abusive with them. He also said that Lynn had warned him when he left that if she couldn't have him, nobody would. So months went by before he even saw Lynn again. And while they were apart, Lynn had been working on getting a new boyfriend. Of course, another guy who worked at the sheriff's department. And he also loved motorcycles and NASCAR. I bet. I bet he did. So despite both of them going on with their separate lives, Randy still couldn't make a complete break from Lynn. He hated being an absentee dad, and he felt a lot of guilt over it. So he began talking about getting back with her for the sake of his kids. Now, his mother was happy for her grandchildren because she worried about how Lynn was taking care of them. Lynn was not a warm, loving mother. Well, then, and also in early 2000, Randy said something shocking to a friend. He confided that he had suspicions about whether Lynn had killed her first husband, her husband, Glenn Turner. Randy's parents began checking in with their son several times a week just to make sure he was okay. 
because they knew that Lin was making his life very difficult. And they were also very concerned about his health. Now at this time he had a chronic respiratory condition, which was potentially career ending because he was a firefighter. So his mother was encouraging him to go to a doctor and get that taken care of. So that May, Randy had sinus surgery. But unfortunately it wasn't as successful as he hoped it would be and he continued to have respiratory problems for the rest of that summer. Then in October he was diagnosed with a staph infection and he needed IV antibiotics. Within a few days of that he was feeling fine, but then on the doctor's advice he had a procedure to put in a catheter in his chest so he could be hooked up to IVs without having to restart an IV in his veins all the time. But despite these health problems, Randy was feeling pretty good about himself now. He really loved being a firefighter, and he'd also enrolled in an EMT class, and he'd gone back to church. He made an appointment for December 15th with infectious disease specialist Dr. Michael Daly to finally take care of that problem once and for all. So when he saw that doctor, he complained that he was still in chronic pain, and just before Christmas, he told his mom that he was going to try and work things out with Lynn. If seeing his kids and being a proper father meant moving back in with her, then that's what he would have to do. They had been talking and they hadn't been fighting, and Randy told the same thing to a firefighter who'd been his friend for many years. Randy had also showed off a new watch that Lynn had given him, but then he also said that he was concerned because Lynn went through money like it was growing on trees. The day after Christmas, Randy returned to Dr. Daly's office. He had severe phlebitis in his left arm, and the catheter had to be removed. So this is just phlebitis is an infection around the site of the IV. Probably came from not properly being cared for. Yeah, it must have been like a pick line in his arm. Yeah. Yeah. So, But he still needed the meds, so they replaced it. Not in the same spot. Then on January 19th, 2001, Randy canceled dinner plans with a buddy from work. He explained that Lynn had called and asked him to meet her at the North Point Mall in Alpharetta so they could pick out a birthday present for their daughter. Her birthday was a week away. She had suggested that afterwards they take the kids out for dinner. He admitted that he hoped she would let him come back home. He even joked to Paul that he was counting on getting me some that night. But later when he talked to his mother, he sounded depressed. He told her that they had taken the kids to the Longhorn Steakhouse using a gift certificate she and his dad had given him at Christmas, and Lynn had done or said something that had upset him, but he wouldn't tell her what it was. So at 7.45 the next morning, Randy's friend Paul Adams got a 911 page from Randy, and Randy told him, I don't feel so good, I'm breathing funny, can you come over? But when Paul got to Randy's, he found the place was just a disaster. Randy had vomited in the kitchen sink, the living room, and on the bedroom and bathroom floors. He was also hallucinating. So of course Paul was really worried. He looked around and he saw that the recliner and an end table in the living room were knocked over and that the door to the laundry room had been pulled off its hinges. And Randy said, I don't know what's wrong with me. What do you think made you sick? Paul asked him. What do you think made you sick? Paul asked him. And Randy said he didn't know. But he told him he went to Longhorns with Lynn and ate dinner there. So maybe he had food poisoning or something? Yeah, possibly. Then the phone rang, and it was Randy's ex-wife, Dara. And Dara said, I'm calling because Randy was supposed to give me a check for child support today. Then Lynn called, and when Paul told her that Randy was too sick to take her call, she asked him what was wrong with him. She said she really needed to talk to him. Now, despite Paul begging him, Randy refused to let him call an ambulance. And about a half hour later, Lynn called back again, asking if there was anything she could do to help. And just after noon, <clears throat> just after noon, Lynn showed up at the apartment with lunch from Burger King. She gave a nice tea to Paul and the other one to Randy, who took one sip and threw up again. Now, Lynn had a Fennigan suppository for nausea, which she administered to Randy. She stayed about an hour then returned later that afternoon between 3 and 4. She then left and returned around 6 in the evening. She stayed for a while and then said she's going home to put the children to bed. Between her visits, she had called Randy's parents to let them know how sick Randy was. 
Friends of Randy, Melanie and Clinton Harper arrived at his apartment at around 7, and when they arrived, Randy was lying on the couch. When Melanie spoke to him, he didn't recognize her. They knew Randy needed help, but they were still kind of reluctant to call anyone in case this was another suicide attempt. Because if it was, the hospital would tell the fire department and that would be the end of Randy's career, which was really important to him. But by 10.30 p.m., his condition was much worse. So he was finally rushed to Joan Glancy Memorial Hospital in the neighboring Gwinnett County. After he left, his friends cleared out his medicine cabinet and flushed all the pills down the toilet. Then Paul went home to get some sleep, and the Harpers followed the ambulance to the ER. Randy was able to tell the ER doctor that he'd been vomiting all day and had not been able to eat or drink. So the doctor suspected that he had a stomach virus and put him on IV fluids. Well, that sounds familiar. Yeah, it does, doesn't it? He said Randy should have nothing but clear liquids for the next 12 to 24 hours. When he seemed to improve, the doctor wrote out a prescription. His friends said they would stay the night with him and he was discharged and a follow-up appointment was scheduled for Monday, January 22nd. So Paul Adams called at 8 the next morning, and he was relieved when Randy told him he was feeling better. He checked in with his friend many times that day, and Randy seemed to be doing okay. When Randy's mom called that morning, Randy reassured her that he was feeling better. And then when Paul called back at 8.30 that evening, Randy was gasping for air, and he said he was feeling sick. Lynn had dropped by at lunchtime to bring him the prescription she'd had filled for him and a grilled cheese sandwich and tea that he'd managed to keep down. Paul made him promise that if he got any worse, he'd go back to the hospital. Well, you can't ignore that he's feeling better and, and Lynn brings him something to eat and drink and he's sick again. Yeah, you know, it's something you figure out retrospectively, I think. Yeah, I mean, why would you just jump to that conclusion? At 6.45 the next morning, Paul called Randy's mother. He'd worried about Randy all night, and he asked her if she would take him back to the hospital. So around 7, he called Randy, but there was no answer. He called Lynn on her cell phone and told her he was concerned because Randy wasn't answering his phone. But Lynn didn't seem concerned. She told Paul that Randy was probably just sleeping, quit worrying about it. But then Randy didn't show up for work, and he didn't answer any calls. So fellow firefighter Barry H., drove to the Overlook Club apartment complex. He ran up the stairs and banged on Randy's door, calling him on his cell phone while he was ringing the doorbell. He was listening for any sounds in the apartment, but it was all quiet. Then he saw that Randy's truck was still parked in the lot, so he got really worried. He busted the door lock and pushed his way inside. Barry found Randy in the living room lying on the couch with his head propped up against the arm. He was wearing white jockey shorts, and a thick gold chain around his neck, and that was it. Barry bent down beside him, and he could see that Randy was well past any chance of being resuscitated. Seemed like he'd been gone for a while. So he called Lynn, and he called 911. The police and coroner arrived and pronounced Randy dead at the scene at 10.26 a.m., Monday, January 22nd. With no signs of foul play at the scene, it was presumed that he had died of natural causes. He was only 32, just a year older than Glenn had been at the time of his death. So I'm just, why would you say there's no signs of foul play when a 32-year-old has an unattended death? Well, you, I don't see how you can say he died of natural causes well, without an autopsy. Well, they'll do an autopsy, yes. Yeah, which was useless. Yes. So Lynn was at work when she was notified of Randy's death, and her sympathetic boss and colleagues tried to persuade her to leave and go home. But she said, oh no, she was staying, and she worked for the rest of the day and left at the usual time. She did make a call that afternoon to the Social Security Administration to find out what benefits she would get from Randy's death. Although they weren't married, she had children with him, so they would get survivor benefits, I would imagine. I would think. Now, she blamed complications of his sinus surgery for his untimely death. Randy's family thought it was the staph infection that had killed him because that's the only thing that really made any sense. Sure. Now, after Glenn Turner's death, his friend Mike had quit the police force. He was working as a car salesman. Mike had told the other salesman his story with Glenn and how he always believed that Lynn had done something to him. Then, after Randy's death, one of the guys at the dealership 
went over to Mike and told him that they had found Randy Thompson dead. Mike also learned that Lynn had dropped by the dealership to borrow a loaner car to drive her to the boyfriend's funeral. Well, I think he just about freaked out when he heard that, right? <laughs> can only imagine. He immediately called the police and filled them in on what had happened to Glenn and Lynn's partner Randy now. The Georgia Bureau of Investigation, the GBI medical examiner, determined that Randy's death was caused by an irregular heartbeat. So it took months of pressure from Glenn and Randy's loved ones. But finally, in June of 2001, the Cobb County Police began investigating Glenn Turner's death as a possible homicide. The Cumming Police also began a probe into Randy Thompson's death, and they called in the GBI agents for assistance with that. On July 30, 2001, the GBI announced that they had changed Randy's cause of death to antifreeze poisoning, and it was ruled a homicide. Cobb officials exhumed Glenn Turner's body to test him for poisons as well. So in October, the Cobb medical examiner announced the second autopsy showed that Glenn had also died of ethylene glycol poisoning, uh -huh. and that's antifreeze, of course. The investigations continued, and then in July of 2002, the medical examiner announced that Glenn Turner's death was a homicide. Lynn was arrested that November, and she was charged with Glenn's murder. Yeah, the toxicology labs reported that they had found deadly traces of ethylene glycol in both men. Now, statistically, each year there are over 100 ethylene glycol poisoning cases reported to the Georgia Poison Center. Most of the victims are children or animals who have swallowed it by accident. So how had Lynn gotten her husband and her lover to ingest enough antifreeze to kill them? I would just say if you're making food and drinks for people, it's very easy. You can well, hide that very easily. It is, as long as it's hideable. And, and I guess it's just kind of sweet. Very sweet from what I hear, yes. So if you put it in something like Jello or Gatorade or something, yeah, it's not that noticeable. Yeah, I mean, Glenn had been a cop for 10 years, and Randy had worked for the sheriff's office before becoming a firefighter. So they weren't stupid. No. And, and they weren't going to drink a poison on purpose. Well, no, even if you were suicidal, you wouldn't do that. That's a miserable way to die. Uh, yeah. So the investigators needed evidence of Lynn's involvement. And they continued to interview people and continued to investigate Lynn. Then... Police learned that Lynn had visited an animal shelter in 1999 after she and Randy were having trouble in their relationship. And she asked the manager of the shelter, what happens when an animal ingests antifreeze? She also asked questions about how to put an animal down and what medication they use for that. Well, that's not suspicious. Not at all. And was that medicine available to anyone? So she was told that it was a controlled substance and you needed to write a prescription, needed to be licensed to get it. So they right, right. couldn't do it. Right. But wouldn't you wonder why someone would even ask such a thing? Oh, yeah. Now, investigators looked back at the crime scene photos from Glenn's death and they found a photo of the inside of the garage where there was a bottle of antifreeze. Yeah, so apparently this picture showed the plastic jug that Lynn had said Glenn was trying to drink out of. Yeah. But then beside it, there was a bottle of antifreeze, so they didn't really make much of it in the beginning. But now, of course, it's a whole different story. Now it changes. Absolutely. So Lynn went on trial for Glenn's murder in 2004. The evidence was circumstantial, but still really compelling. Many ex-friends of Lynn, Glenn, and Randy Thompson testified to her spending, her debt, and her strange demeanor. Information on Randy's death was allowed in this trial for Glenn's murder by the judge. So Glenn Turner and Randy Thompson were known to be the only two adults in the history of the state of Georgia to have died from antifreeze poisoning. And if you look at it that way, it's very convincing because it's the only common denominator was that they were each in a relationship with Lynn when they died. So what are the odds? Pretty infinitesimal. It seems like it. So Lynn was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. Then in 2007, she was put on trial for the murder of Randy Thompson after a change of venue was granted. She was found guilty for his murder. 
and sentenced to life in prison with no chance for parole. So she's going away forever. Yes. But she died in prison August 30th, 2010. Her death was ruled a suicide after it was determined that she had saved up her antihypertensive medication. It's believed that she had saved up the meds in a quantity to cause an overdose. Interestingly, in 2007, she had lost her final appeal. Yeah, so that kind of makes sense that she would do that, I guess. Now, a little bit of interesting trivia, Dickie, is that Stacy Castor, remember her? I do. She killed her husband and tried to kill her daughter with antifreeze? Mm-hmm. Well, she had said that her husband got the idea to kill himself with antifreeze when they were both watching a news report about Lynn Turner, who had murdered her lover and husband with that poison. <laughs> now, if you're interested, we did cover the case of Stacy Castor on TCB back on March 3rd of 2020. It's episode 285, titled Her Dark Plans. I'd have to say that she was even worse than Lynn Turner, because poisoning your own daughter is just unimaginable, more unimaginable than doing it to a husband or a lover, although they're all crazy. They are. Yeah. So that was uh, an interesting take on ethylene glycol poisoning. It was, and then also I'd say that this Lynn Turner was uh, quite a personality. She certainly sounds like. Yes, just a toxic person, and you know, it's sad that people recognized it early on, but still, this happened. Twice. Yes, yes. It's time for listener feedback. Okay, what have we got for feedback? The first voicemail I have for you, Jill, is from Lena, and she has a case suggestion. Hi, Dick and Jill. This is Lena coming to you from Boston. My sister recommended your show to me, and I have been hooked ever since. I just listen to it all the time. Y'all are really, really great hosts, and I really appreciate how y'all title the titles of each episode and giving highlight to the victim and not the aggressor typically you hear the stories as like the one who killed and and y'all are doing a really great job honoring um i have a suggestion for a case that you could cover this happened recently during the pandemic i live in boston and this happened in boston to a young woman named jazzy correa uh during the pandemic this young woman just went missing so for a couple of days it was all about finding her boston's very small and everybody in the community you know rallied to find her um and then they found some footage of her leaving a club downtown and then um they found footage of a man that picked her up and then there was the man was caught like in another state um, and when he got out of the car he kind of just said like her body's in the trunk so that really shook everyone she had a young daughter and again she's from the community she was very young um, and beautiful and just really shook our community would love to see y'all cover that i think they're currently in court like he's currently in jail he was from providence i believe and i don't have a beer recommendation i'm not a big beer drinker but i am from originally from columbia i'm still catching up on all the episodes because i just started listening to y'all's podcast but i don't know if you've ever tried a colombian beer and if, if, if not dick i would recommend trying a bbc uh, bogota beer company or y'all can pick something from boston which there's so much of all right keep doing your, your great work thank you lena so this case, I was able to find an article about it in the Boston Herald. It says a single mother set out uh, late February 23rd, 2019 to celebrate her 23rd birthday. She was wearing open-toed black pumps with four-inch heels and a bright orange jumpsuit and blue jean jacket. And yes, a very pretty young woman. She and three companions arrived at the venue nightclub late, giving them only an hour and 20 minutes to party before the club closed. The group split a bottle of champagne and two or three shots of Patron tequila, and soon they hit the floor to dance, to hip-hop and Latin music. But the night turned sour when the third companion, Naraya, was combative with Jassy. There was a fight inside the club, 
and Jessie was thrown to the floor. And then outside, the fight continued, and she was thrown to the ground in an alley. So Jessie had kicked off those high heels because her feet were probably killing her. And CCTV recorded her being led into a car with her kidnapper after her companions had left. So to me, you're not a girl's girl if you're going to leave one of your friends behind in the first place when you go out clubbing. That's wrong. But also, having it on CCTV makes me think of one of our favorite ID shows, See No Evil. And this will probably become an episode. I wouldn't be surprised that's once why, the case is all settled. That's why I chose it. Yeah. It, it sounded fascinating. But really tragic when a young person like that. I just, it's heartbreaking, really. And she did have a child. She did. Yeah. And what about the Colombian beer? Have you done that? Have you had I a Colombian? I haven't ever had a Colombian beer. But... We try to do beers from the areas where the crime occurred. So I'd be looking at a Massachusetts beer or a Boston beer. Well, sure. But if we find a Colombian case, then the Colombian beer would be the thing to do. And then I would be happy to do it. Okay. All right. So our next voicemail is from Dan in Vegas. Yeah, he has a, a case suggestion. This this will take a very short time. I just threw this in for some amusement. <laughs> okay. Hi guys, this is Dan from Vegas. Uh, I got a case suggestion for you guys out of New Mexico. So the story is Dick and Joe went up a hill to fetch an organic craft beer. Dick fell down and broke his crown. Now Joe's doing 10 to 20. Maybe you guys have heard of that. Haha, <laughs> love the show. Been listening a long time um, since the Madeline McCann episode in 2016. Wow. Love you guys. Thanks. Bye. Very amusing. Thank you, Dan. I love it. I thought you'd like that. Of course. That we is great. appreciate that you've been with us for this length of time, Dan. Absolutely. You're a long-term guy. Yeah, right? I can't even believe we've been doing it that long. Time flies, huh? Absolutely. One more voicemail. This is from Elizabeth with a case suggestion. Hi, Dick and Jill. My name is Elizabeth, and I'm calling from Narberth, Pennsylvania which is a suburb of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. I'm calling with a case suggestion. Um, I'm calling with the MOVE case. MOVE was initially supposed to be a communal organization that advocated um, natural living, following the laws of nature, and it was founded in 1972. In 1985, there was a firefight, which a police helicopter dropped two bombs on the MOVE house, located at 6221 Osage Ave., the resulting fire killed 11 MOVE members and destroyed 65 houses in the neighborhood. This happened when I was a young child. Um, I've never really understood the background of MOVE and what MOVE really stood for. So I'm hoping that you would choose to do a case on this. So not only myself, but others could learn more about what happened in Philadelphia in 1985. Thanks for everything. I'm a big fan. I've been listening for years and I hope you have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Elizabeth. So this is a fascinating story, and it has a little bit of a political edge to it, wouldn't you say? It does. And I was thinking that it'd be uh, a good history lesson for us all. Yeah, yeah. Well, it kind of reminds me of what happened at Waco, kind of a similar thing, because the fire got out of control and people died, right? Including five children. Yes. So really a horrible event. And the decision to not try to control the fire, just to let it burn itself out. What the hell is that all about? Certainly didn't work out, did That's it? That's crazy. Well, you know, was anyone held responsible for this? I mean, there's well, a lot of criticism. The city lost a lawsuit. Okay. Doesn't name individuals, but they determined that the city was responsible. They used excessive force and they violated the constitutional rights against unreasonable search and seizure. And it earned Philadelphia this nickname of the city that bombed itself. But I'd never heard about it, so really fascinated and like to look into it, see if we can find some books and research about it. We'll check it out. Okay. So for emails, I have one from Tess with a case suggestion. And Tess writes, I enjoy your podcast, and I like how both of you have a different opinion on the stories that you dig deep into. Thank you, Tess. And she writes, I would like to suggest a case that happened in Utah, a young boy named Ethan Stacy. His mother and stepfather abused and murdered him and buried him in the canyons. So this is a horrific case, 
one type that we usually avoid, but really heartbreaking. And I read a little bit about it. It seems that his mother should never have had custody of this child. No, this, like you said, this is a tough case. And I'm not sure from a pediatric aspect I want to do it, but we'll see. Do some research. Well, and even if we don't do an episode on it, I think it's worth reading her email and people can look into it themselves. Correct. Yeah. Okay, we have one more email. This is from Tammy. Tammy writes, I just recently found you guys and I'm addicted. I haven't been watching anything else. I have a suggestion on one crime that I would love to hear your thoughts and opinions on. It is about the death of a hardworking farm wife in Marion County, Iowa, named Shirley Carter. Happened on June 19th, 2015. There are so many interesting and confusing facts, but they ended up charging her son with the murder and he was eventually acquitted for it. I watched the trial on YouTube and I was riveted. Love to know your thoughts. Keep up the great work. Thanks a lot, Tammy. So Shirley Carter was shot to death in her home in June of 2015. The crime scene suggested a burglary. Shirley's husband suspected his son Jason was responsible, and he hired a private investigator who gathered enough information to convince Mr. Carter that Jason was the culprit. In 2016, Carter and his other two children filed a wrongful death suit against Jason and they won the case. Then soon after that, Jason was charged with first degree murder, but he was acquitted. So apparently there was enough evidence for a civil trial, but not enough to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that he was responsible. So I think that's fascinating. I would like to learn more about that one. Me too. So. I mean, just the timing of it in terms of when he was arrested and criminally charged almost right after the civil case was completed. And it's just very, very interesting. Well, and in previous cases, it seems that we've seen a criminal trial followed by a civil trial, not vice versa. Yeah. Plus the fact that it's in the family and everyone in the family except this one son believes he did it. You just have to think he probably did. But, you know, I won't go that far until I read more about it. We'll get into it. Sure. Well, our voicemail recorders, please send us your address if you'd like us to send you the bottle opener and some swag for your efforts. And our email writers, thank you so much. We appreciate your input and your suggestions. They're just great. I hope you'll keep them coming. Well, thanks so much, everyone, for listening. And we'll see you next time at The Quiet End. Got a couple seats we'll save for you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye, guys. 